The Tom Woods Show, episode 958, bonus episode. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. All right, you know by now that I do a bonus episode. That's to keep people happy who want their five libertarian episodes per week. But occasionally I want to stray from that and talk about something that I just happen to be interested in, and I don't want to assume everyone listening is also interested in it, although you darn well should be, because progressive rock is our topic for today, and that is very interesting, and this is something that I'm telling you will improve your life. It will make you a happier person if you learn about this music, and I'm delighted today to welcome Dave Weigel onto the show to talk about it with me, and before I get to Dave, let me tell you that at the end of our conversation, Please do stick around because I want to tell you about a music-related website created by a listener of the show that if you like this stuff, you may find interesting, particularly if you are a musician or an aspiring musician yourself. So we'll get to that after I talk to Dave Weigel, who is a national political correspondent for The Washington Post and author of the new book, The Show That Never Ends, The Rise and Fall of Prog Rock. Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. I, I enjoyed reading this, uh, the show that never ends, and I learned a lot from this, even about bands that I've loved for years and years, and I thought I knew everything, but I learned a lot of really neat stuff in here. And there's an interesting story arc that carries us through the musically tumultuous 70s and, and the, the punk era and what happens to progressive rock. It's all in here, and it's great. But what's interesting is you are a young-ish man. And somehow you and I are both interested in not only older music, but older music that couldn't possibly be more out of fashion. So first, <laughs> let me ask you, how did that come to be? Well, there's a story about it that, that's not super unique. I, I, I was a suburban kid in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, who went online when I was about 15. Luckily, the, this was the, the old you know pop, hiss, fizz modem era of the Internet. And... I liked metal, kind of knew from word of mouth in school that I liked Metallica and Megadeth and bands like that. But from reading these reviews by this guy, Mark Prindle, online, I discovered, well, uh, he has my opinions on metal, he has my opinions on Metallica, he also seems to like this band, yes. So I was intrigued, uh, you know, I think this is kind of proto-Google, so I didn't do a lot of research. I just went to a record store that had uh, cassettes of, of Yes albums for about $3 <laughs> and bought, bought a bunch of them, listened to them back by back, and was blown away. And that was, oh, I want to say that was 1996 or something. So they still, you know, the, they there was a version of Yes that was on tour and everything, but they were way out of the cultural uh, mainstream at that point. And I kept delving uh, as you know, as I went, I lived in England for three years, and that helped. I went to college where I had fast internet connection, could listen to more things. That helped. But I, I discovered it as a fan before I saw any of it live, and uh, that was how it came. But it came. I fell backwards through through metal. I mean, I remember listening to the opening of Roundabout and realizing, oh man, the, these bands I like just ripped off the opening of the song. The oh, the first notes on Metallica's uh, key albums in the '80s. The harmonic followed by the acoustic guitar followed by the riff. That was this. That guest did that first. Okay, so before we go on, I guess we have to do the perfunctory. How would you define progressive rock? Because there are going to be people listening who are listening out of a spirit of goodwill, right. or because I badgered them into listening to this episode, and they don't know what on God's green earth we're even talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, it's rock music that's ambitious and sucks in influences from all manner of music that is not rock. It is, is a bit more European and a bit less influenced by the blues, but it, it's stuff that builds on rock forms but includes classical music, uh, Eastern music, experimental electronic music. Uh, I, I put it that way, and I, I keep a pretty narrow definition of what it is, but a pretty wide aperture for what bands can be included in it, because I, I just copies the wrong word. I took my cues from the way that this was covered in the 60s and 70s by the music industry, by music magazines. And they had a clear definition that was uh, that was also really expansive. There, there were bands like uh, Griffin that are basically playing Renaissance music, and there are bands like Soft Machine that are basically playing out-of-this-world jazz fusion stuff with heavy keyboards, and both of them would be progressive rock, and Mike Oldfield smack in the middle of that. So pretty, it's a pretty all-encompassing definition. It's easier to think of it as... 
in terms of what came around to to destroy it, which was punk. You know, punk was supposed to be DIY and simple and uncomplicated, and progressive rock was very complicated, but in a way that I think is fantastic. Yeah. Now it's so funny that among people I consider good friends, I'm just so different from them. Like Kevin Gutzman is more an Aerosmith type, and he thinks that progressive rock is a whole lot of keyboard noodling. And Bob Murphy listens to more conventional pop music, and uh, Michael Malice listens, you know, appreciates punk. And I, I don't know. I'm just I, I keep telling these people. I know you think this is a matter of opinion, but this really is a question of right and wrong here. Because <laughs> I feel like your lives would be so enriched if you could just take a minute to appreciate this. Let me just give a few examples for people. Um, so we'd be talking about bands like uh, Yes, as we said, or Jethro Tull, or or Genesis in the early days, and, and to some extent in the later days, but back when they had Peter Gabriel, uh, certainly very progressive. Pink Floyd would be a, a, an example, too, as would the Moody Blues, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, King Crimson, Band like this. Now, I'm not a fan necessarily of all those bands. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, I I actually could never quite get into King Crimson, even though everybody told me that I should. Never really quite worked for me. But, well, everyone was right, just just for the record. Oh, <laughs> everyone who told you that's totally right. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, all right. Well, may, maybe I'll maybe I'll revisit it. I mean, of course, I like Bill Bruford, and I, I yeah. like the same sort of style. But anyway, l- let's just let's pick a band at random to pick it apart and and talk about what happened with a lot of these bands. I can't even listen to their first album. Sometimes I can't listen to their first two albums. Like with Yes, for example. I just don't listen to the first couple of albums. I maybe I'm missing something, but I feel like it's like the first season of The Simpsons. The characters are all wrong. They haven't gotten into a groove yet. But when I picked up the Rolling Stone uh, record guide, like in the '80s or something, and they had their reviews of all these albums and they had star ratings. By the time you get to 1973, they're giving all almost all Yes albums one star, maybe two stars. And I thought that was the best stuff they ever did. Mm-hmm. But when I like when I listen to Close to the Edge, it's three songs on the whole album. I feel like the live performances are are much much better than the the studio ones which sound like they're from 1972. But nevertheless, there's something about this music, the combination of of the amazing ethereal Anderson vocals and these amb- ambitious, this ambitious work. Do you feel, where do you feel like they peaked? Cause uh, th- of course, Rick Wakeman hated the four song tales from topographic oceans. That's just right. being too experimental and over the top. What do you think was the best stuff they did? I think the best stuff was close to the edge and, and the fragile, uh, a lot of progressive bands, the most famous and the longest lasting music is generally the best. There are there are gems throughout the catalog. I find I really like uh, going for the one, for example. But I, you really get the essence of what what they did once everything was firing on the right cylinders. Uh, you're right about the first couple of years for some of these bands. This is why I think King Crimson stands out because from the first record they have this extremely forward-thinking sound with uh, especially with the the jazzy horn sections coming in in the middle of riff rock songs they they were very progressive right away uh some of these bands started off as basically british beat music a lot like the who uh the the bands that would become the the bands whose, whose members went on to found yes like tomorrow and the sin uh sound a lot like the who were the action this kind of riff based motown influenced rock and it takes them a, a it takes them a couple of beats to get onto the next stuff but yes by the time of uh, fragile and close to the edge they're writing this music that is multi-sectional that is hard to predict where where it's going to go which is my favorite part of it i mean I, most songs i can kind of figure out verse chorus verse and maybe there'll be a key change at the end and this music is so di- divergent in, inside inside individual songs they're really getting at, at that kind of songwriting by uh, by fragile Oh, by the Yes album, but but really with Fragile. Uh, my personal favorite is Going for the One because oh, there's yeah. just so many beautiful pieces on that on that album. It's not as popular as the others, but of course with with uh, Close to the Edge, I'm going to make an I'm going to make a list. By the way, a must have list for people. But you have to understand, you can't listen to it just once. You have to really, really give it a chance. When you hear these climactic moments from Close to the Edge and and you and I, I mean, I don't know. Speaking for myself, I'm just taken to a comp- another place, especially if I'm at a live performance, which I have indeed uh, been to many times. And it's exciting for me, by the way, that my kids now, I have children 
who love this music. I have chilled, I have a 14-year-old who went with me to the Anderson Rabin Wakeman show last year and had as good a time as I did. And not just trying to make dad happy. It was genuinely uh-huh. that good. So, all right. I, I don't want to, I mean, of course, what you and I could easily do is just talk about these bands and it would be extremely inside baseball. But I want to draw out some themes here. One of my favorite bands, and in fact, the subject of uh, episode number three of this show was uh, Jethro Tull. And I talked to Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. Of course, Ian Anderson is playing the flute, which is highly unusual in rock music. I mean, Peter Gabriel did it a bit, but mm-hmm. he played it in a more traditional way, whereas Ian is playing it in this very interesting, uh, creative, roughhouse kind of way. Yeah. But, but, um, but what's interesting about them is for, – for, I can't listen to their first album either. Sorry, it's just not my <laughs> style at all. But, but the Stand second and third, they're doing some pretty good – well, the This Was album is just ugh, to me. But, but Stand Up's got some good stuff. But Aqualung's great. But what's amazing to me is that they had two albums in a row that were all one song. The whole album was one song, so very limited radio play, yet they both hit number one in America at all one song. And I asked Ian Anderson, what do you think changed? That would never happen today. What do you think changed? And I was kind of hoping he'd say people got stupider or something provocative, (laughs) and I don't even remember his answer. What do you think happened? He wouldn't say people got stupider. Uh, That's the answer some of these guys would would, would use. (laughs) Especially uh, Greg Lake who I talked to before he died for the, for the, for the series for Slayton and for the book, um, blamed it both on kind of public taste moving, but public, that public taste being shaped by this really, uh, what he saw as a venal record industry that just decided to cut bait on what was, on experimental music and embrace punk, even though punk never actually sold very well. Uh, that is, and I do going and going through all my research did find kind of a market, uh, a market role in how this music declined. It was, critics and the industry in terms of the, these labels that had progressive bands uh, th- they really did cut back in 1977 the, while punk was rising in this dramatic way the critics just on a dime flipped from being interested in what these bands were doing to, to disinterested and i would notice that the the readers were not off the train yet uh, in the end of year polls and with the best album or the best uh, guitarist the best keyboard player was as progressive band still did very well but it was pretty much driven by this critical uh, community and i i think you can understand some of that i mean the music had been at that point in the in the high seat for eight nine years which is pretty good amount of time for any kind of trend in music but it, it did seem like there was a it was a assassin you could put your finger on and it was the these critics and these record labels that just said eh, enough of this well, s- some of that started for Jethro Tull with the first of the two album-length albums. Thick as a Brick just seemed like too much, uh, too far a bridge to cross. But then the, the follow-up, A Passion Play, that's the critics just went berserk over yeah. <laughs> how much they couldn't stand that. And yet, I, I personally, I know I'm in a distinct minority, I think it's one of the best things they ever did. And when I did get to not only interview Ian Anderson over the the transom here, but also uh, in person, I, I got to talk to him for about 20 minutes. I wanted to make absolutely, I thought if I accomplish nothing else in this meeting with Ian Anderson, I got to I gotta let him know he's wrong about a passion play, that it's an incredible piece, and I absolutely love it. I'm just, because this is, it's, a, it's like you're following somebody who's, I don't know if, it, I don't remember if he was consciously doing this, but of course you know that all through Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, there's mm-hmm. that heartbeat of that person, there's a heartbeat, and it begins, passion play begins with the heartbeat, and then, the guy dies. <laughs> and so yeah. this is a, a, a tracing somebody's journey through the afterlife, borrowing from Dante and all different sources. It's an amazing work. And I'm curious, it's okay if you disagree with me on it, but I am curious about your opinion of it. I think it, it, it just blew, as a 13 year old kid discovering progressive rock on his own, it just blew me away. Uh, I, I like the way you put it because yeah, when I talked to Ian Anderson, <laughs> I focus a lot on that because some of these interviews, I just wanted to dig extremely deep on one story that was not huge in the public record, and <laughs> his reaction to faction play was was one uh, was one of them. He he just remembered these critics deciding to open up with all guns on it, and um, I don't actually think, it, and I put this in the book, you know they. The, the their manager announced that they they just stopped they'd stopped touring, 
uh, the, it was a it was pure publicity stunt, but they, Jethro Tull was so blown back by the reaction to this album that they would just not perform anymore. Not true. I mean, this is Ian Anderson kind of having a joke with the negative publicity and realized it went too far, and it, it totally colored the way people viewed that album forever. But it is true that after that, they never they never went back to anything that of that scope again. They they go to fairly digestible rock songs, Bungle in the Jungle, War Child, things like that, right? And so I twin that with Tales of Topographic Oceans by Yes. So these two gigantic lunges by bands that I think are very interesting, and there was just enough of a blowback that they, they decided, okay, that's when we've gone too far. And, they, and uh, reading it and as a researcher and then writing about it as a, as a, as a historian of the, for the book, I, I felt really ba- bad about the, the turn people decided not to take. Indeed, indeed. Now, I think even when I compare Jethro Tull to bands that I like, like Yes or Genesis even, what amazes me the most about them is how different each album sounds from the previous one. Mm -hmm. How is the same band producing Aqualung, Passion Play, War Child, Minstrel in the Gallery, Songs from the Woods, Stormwatch, A, (laughs) Under Wraps, Roots to Branches? They sound like a different band every time, and yet... I personally love all of it. That's an incredible thing, and I don't think that's all that common. I mean, certainly the Beatles start sounding a little different in the second half of their careers, but the first three, four years, who knows what album any one of those songs is even on? Uh, it, no, it's a good, good point, and there are a couple of creative forces in the band. There's Andy Anderson, there's Martin Parr, too. Uh, I, the, the common thread I found with a lot of these bands, they just were not satisfied with what they did before, and they had a climate of both fans and, and bookers that were really interested in them and then diverging from album to album and you have probably less of that right now i, th- I think i th- there's not a great call for people to do the same thing every time but there was a i found in the research and a, <laughs> another thing i wish i was there for this kind of very welcoming and accepting culture welcoming experimentation by fans uh you were getting a platter by this band that you would there was great speculation about it almost reminded me reading it of what people people do now on the internet about great directors they like you know, imagining what their next movie might be like there was just a hunger for these bands to do something new the bands felt it too and that did fade in the in the 70s i don't think it ever quite got back i mean well, even when some of these groups record now king crimson is an exception um not a huge one, but an exception. Some of these bands still record. It's just something to accompany a tour that where the music's all going to sound the same. There's a few years where that where they're trying something new each time, and they've got a base of record buyers who want to hear something new. Jethro Tull got beaten up in the press uh, for allegedly doing concept albums. Like they, mm-hmm. Ian Anderson likes to tell the story that Aqualung was supposedly a concept album, and he said, yeah. "No, it wasn't." But what would be so bad about that? I mean, what, what's the, I don't understand the reaction against a concept album. The idea is just that the songs are linked together into some greater work, and that actually seems kind of neat to me. No, and some of these bands are more open about it. Uh, although, one thing I found is that the things that came that approached. Our, uh, our time as pretentious, or remember it as pretentious, weren't really intended to be that way. Even Mike Oldfield doing Tubular Bells, which becomes kind of this token of New Age culture and is done by a guy who's just like drinking a lot of Guinness <laughs> and playing around with instruments. Uh, no, it was just a... There was an archness about a lot of these, these concept albums, a lot of this experimentation. Uh, I think especially once Todd Rumgren, who makes two progressive albums really and starts a band utopia to play the progressive music and then dials it back was just very open about how it was kind of an interesting lark it was a a see if it's a muscle see if you could stretch if in addition to writing digestible pop songs he wrote these big searching pieces with multiple sections and symphonic and symphonic movements Uh, and so there there there's a lot of diversity into what they were trying to do i think the far end you've got a band like magma that, that uh are french but invent their own language and their own cosmos, the planet Kobaya, where it, I have never figured out the plot of these things, <laughs> these records, but the records are meant to kind of craft this fantasy world in the way that you know, Octavia Butler no- novels do. Uh, and that was like, I guess, something that you could call that pretentious, but they had a lot of fun doing it. And just the, the there was a cra- craving by fans for it too. And, and then the music also just is really hard to categorize in a, in a way that I find exciting. I think it's easy for people either to forget or 
not to realize just how popular, actually, a lot of this music that was not particularly commercial in the sense of radio play was in those days when you look at concert tickets and album sales. What can you say about that? No, it was enormous. That's one thing I wanted to convey in the book. Now, obviously, if something's popular it doesn't mean it follows that it's good. No, I don't think I don't think we agree as a culture that Avatar is greater than The Godfather, for example. Uh, but I think it had been forgotten. Just it was this. Well, sorry, it wasn't forgotten. It was uh, part of rock history was that music went into a dangerous cul-de-sac and it was rescued from that by disco and punk. It's uh, more by punk than anything else, especially if we're talking about rock. Uh, what I wanted to convey was that this was first very exper- very bold music, very very creative, creative in a way that not a lot of rock is, and created by men in their early twenties. Uh, they were not writing dinosaur music; they were writing they were writing artistic, wild stuff. And when it was popular, uh, you've got gigantic festivals. You've got the California Jam. You've got ELP headlining uh, a night of the Isle of Wight festival. Uh, you it was the most popular some of the most popular rock music there was uh, and invented in a couple of s- occasions stadium rock as we know it. Now Led Zeppelin was doing it at the same time and Rolling Stones were doing it, but these giant ELP shows where they were trying to convey the sound around a, a hockey arena that <laughs> wasn't built for it and building this quadraphonic system in order to play that, uh, that was radical. The, the, the use of electronics in, in the show in like in a rock piece, same 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 thing, and so the the staging was was bold too, but it, it was on this gigantic scale uh, that has been lost, and I think really only the Clash at their height uh, were a punk band that got as big as even the middling progressive bands when they when they were peaking in the seventies. It was interesting to see Roger Waters take the Wall Show on the road over the past uh, five or six or maybe even more years given that in 1980, they only performed it in maybe four cities, and it was just a gigantic undertaking, and it just impossible to imagine how yeah. difficult it would be. And we don't have anything other than the occasional bootleg video of what that was like, whereas now, uh, I, I mean, I got to experience it a couple of times. That show was so over the top theatrically, but so amazing to to, to sit through, and he sold out big arenas all over the place mm-hmm. performing it all these years later. So there is still some appetite out there for some of these bands, even though Waters doesn't quite have the voice he once did. Um, I wonder why that is so... Is it simply for the theatricality that The Wall has has maintained that kind of level of interest, whereas when Jethro Tull, or now just Ian Anderson, when they tour, it's you know these are fairly modest audiences. Same for Yes uh, and some of these other bands. They get little modest audiences, but everybody rushes out to see the performance of The Wall. Is it just the theater? I don't think it's just the theater. I mean, the, this. I think there was less competition for for your entertainment than it was in the nineteen seventies, and that's not a patch on any of this. But one thing in reading all this and looking at how they put together their stage shows, I kept thinking was, well, I guess it, there weren't really video games yet. There was stuff you could watch easily on your phone. You couldn't pull a TV show on whenever you wanted it. For a big communal experience, you had to go to a concert. uh, And for your personal listening experience, it was more rewarding to take a record home and explore, explore everything about it from, you know, the art, the lyrics, the the, the sound closely on headphones, et cetera. So I think the music got more interesting as people were using it to fill their lives in a way that they just don't right now. Uh, I just music is, I th- I think in general a lot more incidental than it was in in the 1970s. When you were having a chance to interview all these great people, did you feel like it was the interviews were just confirming what you already knew, or did, was anything genuinely surprising? Yeah, I tried to make sure that when I interviewed somebody, I was getting something new. It was I'm trying to think of an example. So it was very clear whenever I emailed somebody or called their manager. Uh, look, I'm not just going to do a greatest hits interview or a, what are your influences, stuff like that. I only called people after I had read everything I could and you know watched all the interviews that existed that they'd put out already. And then I would go to them to fill in gaps. So I would go to 
Steve Hackett, for example, and say, uh, I not, don't need to talk that much about Genesis. You're on the record a lot about it. I want to talk about what you were doing uh, in the period after you leave Genesis and the band is kind of blowing up. So we talked specifically about that uh, when it came to Top Run Grunner. I only want to talk to you about uh, a couple of years of Utopia and uh, initiation and the progressive rock experience. And then that's it. And let's go for like an hour on that. And then, and so they were very specific interviews to fill in these knowledge gaps and mostly fun. They weren't always fun. There are some, some occasions where I had to talk to somebody only as part of a promotional tour. And I kept trying to wrench it back to what I wanted and it wouldn't always go there. Oh, sure. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know what that's like, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do indeed. All right. I have a few more things I want to, I want to make sure I get to. Uh, first of all, so I can see where the music goes and why, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, Jethro Tull continues to make albums all through the 80s and it's different style of music. And likewise, Yes is making albums in the 80s and it's a, it's not quite what they used to be. They sort of get back to that in the 90s and early 2000s a bit, but it's not quite what it once was. And I know that punk came along and all the critics were savaging progressive rock and all that. But what I'm interested in is progressive rock today, because even though it's not filling stadiums, it's nevertheless, there's, it's still very creative and very interesting. And you, for example, toward the end, you talk about one of my personal favorites, Stephen Wilson and yeah. Porcupine Tree. And if I may just add this little anecdote, he's upset in your book. Um, he says that the decision to tour with Yes was a terrible decision because he says the Yes fans, all they wanted to hear is music they knew already. They had no interest in hearing new music. Mm -hmm. But that's where it was at a Yes show in 2002 or three that I first encountered Porcupine Tree. That was how I became a fan. So it wasn't entirely wasted. But what he's failing to see is, at the time, what album was Porcupine Tree promoting? In Absentia, which is an extremely dark exploration of psychopaths and serial killers. So you can imagine what's up on the video screens. That's not what you're expecting to see before you hear John Anderson's angelic voice. So yeah, that is going to go over a little flat on a yes <laughs> audience. Hello. But otherwise, but anyway, I think he's fantastic. And I think in some ways, some of these newer bands may even, and I know this is heretical to say, may even be making music that's even better than the original progressive people. So how do they fit into this story? Well, they end the story because I look the the, the subtitle is always going to be about the fall of the music because there was a period when it was dominant and then it stopped being dominant. So by definition, there is a fall. Yeah. Uh, but Will I, Wilson really shapes a lot of my thinking on it. We had, we had a long interview. Uh, you know, I, I looked at what he his his introduction into progressive rock was kind of like mine, except he's an actual musician. He's discovering this, then going recording these fake pop symphonies on his own, only fake in that he would literally create a fake band that was meant to be playing this with a fake live concert and fake live sounds. Uh, so he loved the presentation of the, of the music as it was, but he was not interested in it just being something locked in amber that you, that you gazed at and never changed. He, he, he was, and I think he was frustrated. It comes out that once progressive rock fell off as, as the main creative force, it just, there stopped being experimentation in it. It was progressive meant you sounded like yes. Uh, and some of the revivalist bands in the 90s, just long keyboard sections and some drum solos and mystical lyrics, but nothing new. So this is argument was that progressive metal is the last, not just new thing in progress in progressive music, but in rock period, which is controversial, but I don't think, I don't think terribly wrong. Oh, that's an interesting thought. And then he himself is notorious for saying, I don't want to repeat myself musically. I don't want to do something I've already done. Yeah. And I think that's what he probably felt which was happening with Porcupine Tree, where the last couple of albums were fine, but they seemed a little bit formulaic and, and cold. They didn't impress me the way some of the earlier stuff did. Whereas now his solo stuff, it is dramatically different. I don't know what you've heard of his new CD before it's come out yet, but... Uh, there's dramatically different stuff on it. But, the, of course, the trouble with that is sometimes you like what somebody did. And then he's I, – I find some of his solo material absolutely unlistenable. Yeah. And other stuff I find beautiful and, and, and captivating. Let me ask you if you had to recommend – of course, first of all, first thing as a guidepost here people should do is get – the Show That Never Ends, The Rise and Fall of Prog Rock by David Weigel, being linked at tomwoods.com slash 958 for your convenience. But suppose you wanted to guide people, newbies, well-meaning newbies, who say, yes, I want to expand my horizons, but, you've, but I'm limiting you to five albums you can introduce them to. Choose wisely, Dave <laughs> Weigel. What would they be? 
so there's two ways to answer it. One is just my five favorites. The other is what would give you a, a bigger breadth of what's possible in the music. So I'll go with the second one. And I'll say still, you, you kind of have to start with uh, In the Court of the Crimson King, the first King Crimson album. Uh, again, just amazing for this band being incredibly young. I mean, young, like as young as people getting out of college, uh, some some cases younger, and coming out with something so fully formed and experimental. So first, start with that. Uh, I ha- I would go with Moving Pictures as a Rush album, uh, and it, for just the, the sense of what people were doing with the second wave of progressive rock music. And then in between then, I would say, uh, yes, is uh, Selling England by the Pound. You mean Genesis Selling England? Sorry, sorry. Genesis Selling selling England by the Pound. Uh, Yes, Close to the Edge. And then I've got a free one, don't I? So Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I would say Soft Machine third, because I just think... I don't even know that one. It's, well, Soft Machine are... They were covered as part of all the progressive rock movement. I think it's fair to put them in that. They, They started absolutely within the form and then became a much more esoteric jazz uh, self kind of jazz fusion band that album in particular is just such a good example of what you could do if you stayed kind of within the the rock band format but totally broke away from the the norms and the limitations and it's too it's to a bunch of extremely long pieces of music some of them all, almost sound collages uh, and if you I can imagine somebody not liking that, and if you don't go go to Thick as a Brick by Jethro Tull, which is also very good, but in terms of something that uh, breaks the form, but it, you're going to recognize, I I really think Soft Machine Third holds up. Yeah. All right. Well, I I'll check that out too, and I'm, I'll give King Crimson another try. I mean, it's been years and years since I since I originally did. I I do want to say a quick thing about my own concert experiences. Uh, in the in, last year, I told you I went to. Well, they're now called Yes, featuring Anderson Raven yes. Wake, but nobody's interested in all these name change things. But but John Anderson was approaching seventy two years old, I I believe that year, and so you you figure okay, he'll play it safe. He'll come out and do. Not that there are that many safe vocal songs from Yes, but he came out and he's singing Heart of the Sunrise. He's singing the most challenging songs in the catalog <laughs> and just blowing the roof off the place. Did you see him on that tour? Uh, not on that tour, no. I mean, I've I've seen him. I've seen recordings more recently, and yeah, it hasn't. It's amazing how how good he still is. It is, is. amazing. This in is his something 70s. It's too esoteric to get into, but yeah, this yes or no kind of facing the challenge that the Beach Boys and these bands have faced for years, which is a band called Yes that includes. Two guys who were there for most of the those of the key music, and a band called Yes that includes different members of the band who were yeah, there. Yeah, I key know. Music. <laughs> yeah, so that that's right. So you want the one featuring. Uh, to, to me, at this point, you got to have the one featuring Anderson, Raven, Wickham, especially since Chris Squire is now gone. But to see him still able to do that when when poor Ian Anderson hasn't really had a his his voice work right since the mid '80s, but for John to come out like that, and then what I what I found really interesting in your book was. Of course, after 1979, John Anderson leaves the band. Just, it, just d- not not happy with things. He he leaves. They replace him with the guy from the Buggles. If you, if you're my age or maybe even your age, you might remember Video Killed the Radio Star. Yeah, yeah. The Buggles. So Trevor Horn, who was more known as a as a record producer and indeed a very accomplished one, he becomes the front man, and he's got to sing impossibly difficult songs written for a guy with. You know, let's face it—a a, a freakish voice. It's an amazing voice that you could never duplicate. So he's there in the and the way you you put it is there he is all alone in the middle of this round stage, and he's got a, he's got all eyes on him for a forty-four mm-hmm. date U.S. tour, and he's basically just a record producer trying to sing the most impossible songs in the world. And and the story that I like was they go in, well, tell the story, <laughs> they they go in and talk to their manager, whom they fire, who tries to give them some advice. Now, what's the advice? Uh, they meet him, the, the advice is, you, you've got to go on your knees and beg John Anderson to come back. <laughs> you know, like this, this band is not quite working. I'm a defender of the of the band of the album drama. I think it's actually, and but yes, which was the album that was done without John Anderson. Yeah, it, it is. And and Trevor Horn, who is the producer slash lead singer for it, uh, ends up being a pretty good imitator of John Anderson. But it, he's the first to admit, like this is, these are extremely tricky vocal parts. He's he's written for himself. And uh, yeah, the, the, that's the, that was the advice. Just beg John Anderson to come back. This is not. Yes, that John Anderson. It's not going to work. You know, and and ever since I I started going to Yes shows that didn't have John, 
Uh, like that, I think that guy's name was Benoit David, the first guy they had. And first Benoit David, then, then John Davison, who kind John of looks Davison's, like John Davison. John, John Davison is doing a creditable job. Yeah. Um, but whereas the other one uh, was, tr- I mean, sounded more like John, but the trouble was, I mean, really, if you listen to him on uh, either on their album, uh, what was what was the album that they did together? Uh, uh, Fly from here. Fly from here, right? And then also on YouTube, they you know he said, but in the under the strain of a concert, I kept finding him hitting. F- he was flat a number of times. His voice cracked a number of times. He didn't have that presence that John had. And I remember thinking, well, you know, it'll be like eighty percent as good. And I felt like it was only like 30 to 40 percent as good. I was disappointed in, in that. So to have John triumphantly return now in good form mm-hmm. is deeply satisfying. Well, anyway, this is uh, I'm, I'm glad you did uh, f- for selfish reasons. I'm glad you did this because it really <laughs> filled in a lot of gaps in my knowledge. But I hope also this will be especially since you're a young guy. If you were 55, we'd have less chance of getting some of these youngsters to listen to what we're saying. But you still have a chance to reach them. Save yourselves, folks. You don't have to listen to what's being churned out today, uh, unless it's the things we recommend. There are great things being churned out today. You just don't know about them. But I, I urge people to check out the show that never ends, The Rise and Fall of Prog Rock by David Weigel on Amazon or wherever great books are sold and, of course, linked at tomwoods.com slash 958. Well, I kept you a little longer than I said I would, but honestly, I want to just keep talking forever, but um, I can't do that. It's a libertarian show. (laughs) Once in a while, my my listeners indulge me. They let me do this sort of thing. But uh, thanks so much for your time today. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, make sure and get the show that never ends. If if this stuff floats your boat, you're going to like it. But Also, listen to the music that we recommend because we have good advice, and I will have a list of the items that I recommend also beneath Dave's at TomWoods.com slash 958, so you can check that out there. But also, check out this brand new website created by a listener of this show called WriteASongFast.com, and it's for people who have wanted to write their own songs, but they find that it's actually a heck of a lot harder than they thought, and You check out his report that he's written that answers a lot of your questions, helps you get over a lot of obstacles, a lot of stumbles that you might have. He's going to help you get over. Very interesting and worthwhile. So if this is your thing, if you are a musician, if you'd like to write a song, you're going to get a lot of help and save yourself a lot of frustration. If you check out writeasongfast.com, and of course, remember... I will be linking to that also at tomwoods.com slash 958, and you can get publicity for your website right here on my show. If you've been thinking about starting one, make sure you get your hosting through my link, and then I'll give you free publicity and a host of other bonuses, including membership in my private bloggers group and tutorials and all kinds of glorious stuff, all of which is listed at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Regular episodes resume with 9.59 tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.